All right, away we go. I hope. There we go. William Carey. Born in 1761 in England, in Northamptonshire, England, he was the son of a weaver. Now, a weaver was kind of a lower middle class uh, job. It was semi-skilled. The point is that the, fa the family was provided for but not wealthy. And so even though William Carey was a quite bright young man, the possibility of him getting any kind of formal education, going to the university, as others might have with equal intellectual powers was pretty much foreclosed. They didn't have scholarship programs and so on that would have opened those doors. And so William Carey is one of those characters that comes along who just by sheer native genius and personal effort is able to acquire a rather startlingly good education, but he does it more or less on his own. By the time he was 10 years old, he had fully mastered Latin. Now, he had a little bit of help. There was an older guy in town who was a university graduate who had studied Latin, and he recognized in William Carey that very bright and precocious child and was able to give him a little bit of help. But basically, Carey was self-taught and became highly competent in Latin. And this was kind of the story of his whole career, learning languages, learning subject matter, essentially based on his own kind of homeschool efforts without a lot of help from outside. Because he wasn't able to go for formal training or formal education, he was apprenticed, which was very common in those days, and in this case it was to a cobbler, a shoe repair kind of profession. He was, um, I was mentioning this somewhere the other day, and someone immediately pictured a cobbler, like a peach cobbler in their mind, and they couldn't quite figure that out, you know, so I thought I'd clarify. Not that any of you would labor under that uh, misguided idea. But anyway, he was apprenticed in this cobbler shop. And thus, one of the images that's often associated with William Carey, kind of affectionately down through history, is sitting in a cobbler shop and doing his studies. He would repair shoes over here and be reading books over here. It was that sort of thing that he was able to engage in. He was reared in the Anglican Church, the official established church in England, but in his mid-teenage years shifted to what were called the dissenters. Now, if you've been in this class for a while, you know the official church in England was the Anglican Church. Ever since the time of William and Mary, there had been a policy of toleration for other religious denominations. And so there were always those who were called the nonconformists. They operated outside the Church of England. They had, of course, been persecuted in an earlier age, but now they were given a certain amount of religious freedom. And so this dissenter movement, or the nonconformists, was attractive to Carey, largely because they had what appeared to be a much more evangelistic or evangelical kind of e uh, emphasis within them. And so he shifted to them. They were congregational in their church governance. You know, the two extremes here were Episcopal on the one hand, top-down authority, that was Anglican, Catholic, of course. On the other hand was a very democratic approach, majoritarian kind of rule, almost partly expressing an objection to that kind of authoritarian hierarchical approach to church life. So that was where he wound up, at least for a time, among this dissenters group, as they were called. It was during these years that he also learned Greek, and so by the time he was in his early teenage years, he was pretty much uh, had mastered Greek, mastered Latin by that uh, time as well. At the end of his career as a, an apprentice, he went to work for a fellow named Thomas Olds, O-L-D-S, uh, who, who had a shoe, he was actually a shoemaker, and so William Carey went to work for him as a shoe repairer, kind of working in the back room there. Thomas Olds had a sister-in-law named Dorothy, Dorothy was illiterate. She was a lovely person, but she was not very well educated and probably didn't have the mental powers or anything like it with William Carey, so they never did quite gel, I would say, in terms of a deep kind of intimacy at the point of uh, intellectual connection, but, but they had a loving relationship, although it became difficult as years went on, as we're going to see in a moment. But anyway, he married her in 1781, when he was, of course, 20 years old. It was during those years that he taught himself, in addition, Hebrew, Italian, Dutch, and French. 
He became fluent in all of them. So here's a guy, by the time he's 20 years old, who has dis demonstrated a very remarkable genius, especially for languages. He was very interested in, in the sciences. He was interested in agriculture and botany and uh, various. He was kind of one of those Renaissance minds that just devoured everything that he could discover, and, uh, but especially languages were of great interest to him. In 1783, two years after he had uh, uh, married, he shifted from the so-called dissenters, the congregational group, to a group that were called the Strict Baptists. They were actually called the Particular Baptists. Isn't that cool? I always thought we need some particular Presbyterians. Doesn't that have a nice ring to it, you know? Uh, they were called this. I'm going to try to lower that a little bit. Um, they were called this. It was kind of a term of art that was to say that they were joining in the congregational, the dissenter movement generally in England, but they took a different view of the character of how baptism should be celebrated. The congregational churches generally practice what's called paedo-baptism or infant baptism, as we do as Presbyterians, as most Christians have down through history. The Baptists distinguished themselves precisely at that point, and thus they called themselves Baptists saying that you shouldn't baptize a person until they have confessed faith in Christ. So it's called believer's baptism, adult baptism. And they also were deeply committed to the Reformation tradition, especially a Calvinistic view of it. So they were Baptists, they were Calvinists, and they had this rather well-defined theology, and thus they came to be called strict Baptists. I might mention that Baptist churches that we're familiar with. We have Baptist churches, of course, here, and you're aware that that's a major denomination across the, or several denominations across the country, really got their beginning at this time. This is when the Baptist church got going. It was a, kind of the middle to late 18th century in England. It didn't go, uh, the Baptist churches we have today did not go so much back to the Anabaptists of the Reformation era. The Anabaptists have their descendants in groups like the Amish, the Mennonites, the Hutterites, and others of that particular flavor, much more insulated kinds of communities. That was the Anabaptist tradition. The Baptist tradition, when we think of First Baptist Church, for example, goes back to this time in English history. And so they began in the Reformation tradition, but dissenting at the point of whether or not it's appropriate to practice infant baptism. So William Carey's a Baptist. I wish I could claim him as a Presbyterian. I can't, but I grew up Baptist, so I'm gonna make a little claim to him on that basis as well. So anyway, here's uh, William Carey. He joins this group in 1783. Two years later, because of his conspicuous gifts in communication and languages and scholarship generally, even though he had no formal training, he had no seminary education or any such thing, nevertheless, he was ordained as a pastor in this uh, Baptist denomination. It was at this time, 1785, when he was first becoming a pastor and beginning to preach every week that he read two books which were to have a lifelong impact on him. One of them was the book I mentioned earlier, David Brainerd's memoirs, his journal, and William Carey was riveted by the spirit and the vision of that book. And at the same time, he was reading the book by Captain Cook, Captain James Cook, famous traveler of the world who wrote, of course, exciting, adventurous stories and descriptions of the things he had found as he sailed around the world and so on. And those two more or less galvanized in the imagination of William Carey a vision of on the one hand missionary effort and on the other hand to the world and especially to those major population centers in the world that had never heard the name of Christ, let alone been exposed in any meaningful way to the message of the Christian gospel. So somehow or other, those two books, plus his new career as a preacher, all came together for him and the year was 1785. At this time, he's only in his early 20s, as you can see. He's a young man, he's full of gusto, as young men can often be, and he thinks he's onto something, and once people hear it, they're gonna be so excited about it, they'll hardly be able to contain himself, themselves. And so the following year, with a high degree of 
enthusiasm, he went to the first gathering of the Baptist pastors in this little Baptist denomination with which he was affiliated. This was in 1786, and because he was the new kid on the block, he was given the opportunity to give a little sermonette, a little devotional to these other pastors, many of them much older, much wiser, of course, much more experienced. And so he got up and he pitched world missions that we Baptists and Christians generally, wherever they may be found, should be mobilizing our forces, both financially by finding people and training them and so on and sending them to the world to proclaim the gospel in these places that are tragically caught up in the darkness of civilizations that can be so brutal and ghastly because the light of the world has never shone on them. And he made that case. At the end of his presentation, a man by the name of John Ryland, much older Baptist pastor, said this, quote, sit down, young man. You are an enthusiast. When God pleases to convert the heathen, he'll do it without consulting you or me. That statement was so embarrassing that the son of John Ryland, whose name was also John, some years later denied that his father ever said it. But that, in a case, just made the case that he had said it, and I think it's pretty good evidence that it was said. Now, that might, that might strike you as an odd statement. And the, what, the point I'm going to make in the next 60 seconds or so is, is difficult to make in such a short time. But I said these Baptists were heirs of the Calvinistic tradition. In some way, if I, could, if I could put it in these terms, they were more Calvinistic than Calvin. Calvin would never have said something like this. You see, Calvin understood that God reaches people, though he chooses them, sovereignly, secretly. This is not something God discloses. He does this as part of his great sovereign purpose in history. Our task is not to try to run around figuring out who's elect and who's isn't, you know, as a Calvinist. If you're a Calvinist, you understand. You preach the gospel to every creature. You see a creature, you preach the gospel. You see? That's the rule. And then God may, in his good pleasure, regenerate the heart of someone through the hearing of the gospel, but God still uses means. There has been in history a kind of a minority of Calvinists who've gone way beyond Calvin himself. This is sometimes called hyper-Calvinism or extreme Calvinism. It goes by various terms. And they would sort of rule out the use of means. You see, the God is sovereign. He does what he wants. And why should we bother thinking about it? It's up to God. That's the, that's the attitude reflected here. And there was something of that going on in this particular corner of the Baptist movement in England at the time. So if that makes sense. That's why, it, you know, it, sometimes people, if they hear a, you're a Calvinist, they immediately leap to a sort of strange, perverse understanding of Calvinism that certainly Calvin himself would repudiate outright. Well, this view represented that kind of vision of things, and William Carey, of course, disappointed at the, at the response, nevertheless was more or less undaunted in his commitment to the fundamental thesis. And he went back to his college. He was a preacher, but he still had to earn a living. He didn't make a lot of money preaching, so though he was ordained and he was pastoring, he still was continuing his labor as a cobbler. But he began to work on something that came to be called his cobbler's map or Carey's map. So as he was laboring away in his cobbler shop, he was studying books describing populations of the world. And this really is kind of what it was. He was working on shoes over here and reading books over there. And he produced, using the scraps of leather that were the kind of the effects of his cobblering. Is that a word? I don't know. He pieced together, cobbled together, literally, a map of the world. And this map of the world 